Right now, Congress is debating one of the most sweeping reductions in U.S. corporate taxes in the history of the United States. The goal of these tax cuts is to stimulate capital investment, bring back trapped overseas profits, level the playing field with other countries, and unleash economic growth that the supporters of these tax cuts argue will benefit middle-class Americans. Let's take a look at those arguments. One of the claims being made in support of cutting corporate tax rates is that the tax rate on U.S. corporate profits is the highest in the world. What's missing from this argument, though, is that the U.S. is the only country in the OECD that taxes profits but doesn't tax corporate value added. But corporate value added, essentially corporate revenues, are a multiple of profits. So by not taxing them at all in the U.S., the taxes paid by U.S. companies are already the lowest in the world. You can see this in the following charts. The first chart shows tax rates in OECD countries. Most of these countries have two bars except the U.S. The blue bar is the tax rate on corporate profits, and the red bar is the tax rate on corporate value added, essentially corporate revenues excluding double counting. Of course, corporate revenues are much larger than corporate profits, but in the U.S., there's no value added tax at all. So yes, the tax on corporate profits is higher in the U.S. than elsewhere, but that alone is an apples to oranges comparison because the U.S. is the only country without a value added tax. To get a sense of the combined level of taxes on corporations, we can blend the two taxes by assuming the corporate profits are about one-fifth of corporate value added. And if you look at the data, that figure is just about right. This chart shows the overall level of corporate taxes across countries as a percentage of revenue. And what you see here is that total U.S. corporate taxes are the lowest among them all. Now, regardless of whether a tax is raised from consumers or producers, the impact of that tax will fall partly on both. But the current tax proposal is so laser focused on cutting taxes on profits that an even wider disparity between the rich and the middle class is virtually certain. In fact, more than half of the tax benefits in this plan will go to the top 1% of income earners, and 30% of the benefits will go to the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of income earners. Very honestly, as an economist, I think this plan is an assault on the majority of Americans. In fact, the Tax Policy Center estimates that after 10 years, when the income tax cuts expire, but the cuts in corporate profit taxes remain permanent, fully 80% of the savings will go to the top 1% of income earners. Let's talk about good tax policy. Economists generally agree that the way to raise tax revenue with the least amount of distortion to the economy is to broaden the tax base and lower the tax rate. That means defining income as broadly as possible so that even a moderate tax rate will still produce enough revenue. Now, the current tax proposal does give lip service to that idea. For example, the proposal wants to broaden the base by eliminating the deduction for state taxes. So if you pay high taxes in, say, New York or California, you'll no longer be able to deduct the state taxes you've paid when you calculate your federal income tax. Well, that's one way to broaden the base. But look, the most glaring feature that creates distortions and in income disparities in the U.S. tax code is the way we treat payroll income versus how we treat profits. Unfortunately, this tax proposal makes that disparity dramatically worse. This chart shows the reality of the situation. Wages and salaries of working Americans as a share of the economy are near the lowest level in history. In contrast, corporate profits as a share of the economy are near the highest levels in history. In fact, it's easy to show that current record profits in the U.S are the direct outcome in the mirror image of reduced compensation to ordinary employees. If you flip the labor share over upside down, it's clear that corporate profits are high precisely because labor costs are low. Yet 
we want to cut taxes on profits so they can increase to an even larger share of the economy? One of the arguments for this proposal is that cutting taxes will spur new investment and really get the economy going. The issue here isn't whether new investment is a good thing or not, but whether cutting taxes on record corporate profits is a good way to reach that goal. As an economist, I'm a big fan of productive investment. In our economic models, we call it capital, with a big K, as in the quantity of output Q is a function of labor, with a big L, and capital, with a big K. Both labor and capital contribute to a growing economy. Now, we like productive capital, with a K, because it helps to expand the country's output, and also because given any level of employment, having a higher and more productive capital stock usually means that workers are more productive. They produce more for an hour of work, and over the long term, that supports higher wages and a higher standard of living. That's because in the long run, the only way for a company to enjoy a higher standard of living is to have growing labor productivity. The standard of living is the amount of goods and services Americans can command for an hour of work, and labor productivity is the amount of goods and services Americans can produce for an hour of work. In the long run, higher standard of living requires higher labor productivity. So we want productive investment, and a broad productive investment that benefits the economy can take all kinds of forms, including equipment, information technology, factories, as well as investment in knowledge, like research and development, job training, and education itself. If we want a growing economy, we should be encouraging and advantaging those types of spending directly. Policies like that should have the support of both parties. But cutting taxes on profits and just hoping for the best, very frankly, is insane. Meanwhile, there's been a push to slash health care benefits in a way that would leave millions of Americans uninsured. Not because that's good policy, but because the money is needed in order to finance tax cuts on corporate profits. Now, everybody should hope for more capital with a K, meaning productive investment. Economists know that it's best not to punish capital by taxing it heavily. But U.S. policy already encourages capital with a K. It isn't taxed, because when a company spends money on productive capital, it already deducts that spending from income, either immediately or by depreciating it over time. And it's a fine idea to encourage more productive capital by allowing companies to deduct new capital spending immediately. But here's the problem. Over time, the word capital has been quietly twisted so that we've increasingly blurred it to mean financial capital, profits, stocks, bonds, money. We call financial capital, capital with a little c. While financial capital, capital with a little c, is, is certainly needed in order to finance productive investment, financial capital can also be used for all kinds of other things like financial investments and real estate and homes and cars and yachts. And while that sort of spending may benefit the economy too, the question we should ask is this. Why should a dollar of income earned by a worker on a factory line be taxed at a higher rate than the same dollar earned by someone trading stocks on a computer or passively owning a business. When our tax code gives preference for a dollar of income depending on whether it was earned as wages or whether it was earned as profit, that's where the real distortions come in. We might think that a dollar of income should be treated as a dollar of income, but that's not how it works in the tax code. And the current tax cut proposal would make the preferred treatment of profits and financial gains even more distorted. If an employee brings home a dollar of income in a paycheck, it's subject to both payroll taxes and income taxes. But somehow, if a dollar comes in as profits, oh no, it's sacrosanct. 
It's not subject to payroll taxes and it benefits from lower preferred tax rates. If we slash taxes on regular corporations and we give preferred treatment to the profits of so-called pass-through corporations, then the overall result will be to widen the disparity between income earned in the form of wages and income earned in the form of profit. Let's be clear. If more financial capital was enough to stimulate real productive investment, that would already be happening because companies are earning record profits. Instead, companies have plowed those profits into purchases of their own stock, not because stocks are cheap, but because interest rates are low and frankly, the largest form of compensation for most corporate executives is in the form of stock shares. Let's also be clear. The so-called trapped overseas profits of U.S. corporations are neither trapped nor overseas. If I'm a big corporation and I hold a billion dollars of profits in a bank in another country, one of two outcomes is likely. First, let's say I need the money for new investment. I can go out and borrow it on the U.S. bond market at corporate interest rates that are currently the lowest levels in history. Then I can enter what's called an interest rate swap to make it exactly as if I had brought the money home from abroad. The volume of interest rate swaps in the global financial market exceeds $400 trillion. Yes, trillion. Does anyone imagine that the global financial system is so unsophisticated that a company with money overseas couldn't structure indirect access to it with an investment bank and a few bookkeeping entries? The second possibility is that the company doesn't need the money. And in that case, the foreign bank isn't going to just shove the money into a closet. It's going to buy an asset. And given the massive deficits that the U.S. already has, it's a good chance that that asset is a U.S. Treasury bond or a bond issued by a U.S. corporation. If the U.S. increases its deficit in order to fund a cut in corporate taxes, America will end up even more indebted to foreigners, not less. The bottom line is that trapped overseas profits are neither trapped nor overseas. We already know what will happen if we give U.S. corporations a tax holiday to repatriate their foreign profits. We know because we already tried it in 2004. Most of that money went into dividend payments and purchases of the company's own stock. In fact, the largest beneficiaries reduced their level of both U.S. employment and capital investment over the following years. Again, we should all be for productive investment. But the way to stimulate productive investment is to encourage it directly through targeted investment tax credits, policies that encourage education and job training, research and development, and direct expensing of real capital spending. If we want to give U.S. corporations a tax holiday on money they bring home, well, we could do that, but we should do it only to the extent that the spending of that company on productive investment and wages exceeds their recent average. At least that way, we would make sure that the tax benefits being used to stimulate new spending. That's a policy that could have bipartisan support. Finally, let's talk about economic growth for a minute. The growth of the economy is equal to the sum of two things, growth in the number of people who are employed and growth in output per worker, what we call labor productivity. For much of the period since 1950, these two drivers have contributed about 2% each to real U.S. GDP growth. Now, much of the reason for lower U.S. economic growth in recent decades is that U.S. population growth has slowed substantially. So while labor force used to add about 2% annually to GDP, it now only adds about one half of 1%. With the unemployment rate now down to 4.2%, there's not a lot of slack in the labor force to fuel the starry-eyed growth projections that would presumably make these tax, tax cuts pay for themselves. Look, we used to have about seven U.S. workers per retiree. Now it's closer to three. If anything, we should also be encouraging more immigration, not less particularly for services jobs like home health care, where there will undoubtedly be a growing need. 
Labor productivity has also slowed considerably over time. The post-war average was over 2% annually, but over the past 20 years, the growth rate has slipped to just 1% annually, and over the past five years, the growth rate of labor productivity has slipped to just one half of a percent. Add half a percent of labor force growth to a half percent of productivity growth, and the U.S. economy is likely to grow at a rate of only about 1% annually over the coming years. A lot of that, unfortunately, is baked in the cake. In fact, most of the growth we've seen in recent years has been driven by declining unemployment. But with the unemployment down to rate down to 4.2%, that slack has been taken up. If you look at periods where tax cuts were credited for creating economic growth, you'll find that they were typically points where unemployment was high, population growth was expanding, and reasonably balanced trade created a lot of room to borrow from foreigners in order to finance our domestic investment and to finance government deficits. Here and now, however, the idea that cutting corporate taxes will bring a new economic renaissance to the U.S. is just uninformed. It's certainly important to encourage productive investment and to expand our labor force, ideally through thoughtful immigration policies, but the effects of those policies will be felt over decades, not over the next few years. So how do we get more productive investment? Well, it's true that the pace of productive investment in the U.S. has slowed in recent decades, but it's not for want of profits. It's because U.S. policies have increasingly blessed paper investment rather than the real physical kind. We've bent over backwards to reward and bail out financial capital with a little c, but we've done very little to give consideration to real productive capital with a k. For example, more than a decade ago, the Federal Reserve pushed interest rates so low that investors started chasing anything that could give them better returns. That gave us a bubble in mortgage bonds which fueled a housing bubble and ultimately produced a global financial collapse. Since then, the Federal Reserve has actually doubled down, driving interest rates close to zero and encouraging financial speculation across the board. Meanwhile, instead of thoughtful policies targeted at productive investment, education, job training, and research and development spending, our tax policies have made profits a preferred and heavily protected form of income. We've blurred the definition of capital, so we no longer care about productive capital with a K. Instead, both monetary and tax policy have glorified financial capital with a little c. We've created tax loopholes with names like carried interest, and now with corporate profits at record levels and wages and salaries near the lowest share of GDP in history, the brilliant idea is to cut the tax rate on corporate profits? Do our policymakers really think that putting the country even further into debt in the service of corporate profits is the best way to serve the American public? If we want economic growth, we've got to think about expanding productive investment capital with a K by directly targeting that kind of spending rather than blindly tossing lollipops to corporations. We've got to think about expanding the labor force given an aging population and that will require thoughtful immigration policies that recognize the benefit that they can bring to our own country. There are far better policy directions than the current tax proposal and those policies have a much greater potential to brighten America's future. It's time to stop this madness. If you care about the prosperity of our nation and not just some party line, please share this video and call your representative in Congress. Americans deserve policies better than this, better than blind corporate giveaways. I'm Dr. John Hussman. I hope this video has been useful. Thank you for watching.